Uh, David, perhaps I can ask you to say a few words about your, your background and training and how you got to this topic of talking about science and technology policy in the, in the US. Sure, well thanks for the invitation, it's great to be here. Um, I come out of a political science background originally. Um, I did my PhD at MIT and at that time there was a good deal of interest in economic competitiveness and whether Japan was going to um, take over the high-tech industries uh, of the world and take them away from the US. And in that context I got very interested in the innovation capabilities of countries and have remained interested in that uh, since then. Um, I had a chance uh, in 2011 to 2012 to work for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and wound up working on innovation related issues. Uh, there is a contested presidential election uh, in, in midstream now in, in, in the US. But could you just tell us um, what powers and um, challenges does a president have in trying to broadly set policy and implement in the US system and particularly around science and technology and innovation types of issues? Yeah, there's an illusion often that the president is all powerful, that the president can simply make policy and it's not accurate. In fact, compared to most countries, our chief executive is relatively limited and our legislature has more power. Um, so Richard Neustadt, the most famous historian of the president, uh, the presidency famously described um, the president's most important power as the power of persuasion. Um, the president is able to propose the budget, but the Congress must decide what the final numbers are. Um, the president can make appointments, but typically the Senate has to confirm the nomination as we currently uh, see with the Supreme Court. Uh, the president's biggest room for um, unilateral authority is in the area of foreign policy, although the Congress does have some role there. Uh, the president has historically had a good deal of discretion in foreign policy. So when it comes to science and technology policy, um, something like research and development spending, the president's priorities are subject to the confirmation of the uh, Congress. Um, whereas in an area like diplomacy, such as the recent um, uh, climate accords, the president can act with some uh, discretion. Although technically, uh, if um, an international agreement is reached, there are some agreements that must be approved by the Senate. In this case, the President uh, pro decided not to submit it to the Senate, and nonetheless I think it will become uh, the policy of the United States to comply with the parents' accord until another President might choose to um, separate from that. We've heard a lot about gridlock and um, disagreement between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, in various areas of, uh, of policy making in, in Washington. But are there some areas in which you think there's some broad consensus, particularly again in the area of science, technology and innovation? I do. I think the American people are strong believers in science and technology um, and they believe in the, 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 the idea of progress. And so our candidates tend to be united around the idea that science and technology can be solutions to problems. Whereas in some other countries and at some other times in our history, we've seen the view that technology is the cause of a problem, that technology puts people out of work, that technology creates uh, foreign policy risks. But in the current uh, context, and I think most of the time in American history, people are optimists about science and technology. And so therefore, the candidates tend to agree on that. So it seems that the, uh, the presumptive candidates are Donald Trump on the Republican side and Hillary Clinton on the Democratic Party side. Taking each candidate in turn, where do you think they, they stand? What, what have they said? What are the big issues uh, that they've raised related to science and technology? And what are some of the differences between these two candidates? Yeah, so it's a little bit difficult to say at this point in the campaign, mainly because Donald Trump was such a surprising victor in the Republican primaries, and he hasn't said a lot about many of the issues um, that are of interest to science and technology policy scholars. Uh, where he said the most is probably on energy policy. Um, he is very skeptical of climate change as a phenomenon, um, has proposed to expand um, the use of fossil fuels, both extraction and use in the United States. Um, and um, that's where I think the starkest difference is with uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, in other areas, it's a little bit less clear. Um, I think he will be constrained as president by our fiscal situation, so there may not be a lot of room for large initiatives. Uh, Hillary Clinton is um, 
been in the public eye for such a long time and has such a long track record as a public official that I think we know most of her positions. And um, she has published detailed position statements on many of them on her website. Um, and I think her main um, views will be very consistent with the current uh, administration. Uh, she would like to see an expansion of renewable uh, energy. She would like to see investment in um, research and development. Uh, she would like to see investment related to specific industries, including manufacturing industries, uh, by the federal government. Um, so uh, I think many ways the Clinton administration, if it happens, would be like a third term of the Obama administration. Um, and I think the Trump administration, if it happens, is much more difficult to predict. So D Donald Trump, whilst campaigning, has said he will rebuild the coal industry, pull America out of the Paris Climate Agreement, and, and generally uh, defund uh, activity related to climate research. You know, if elected, do you think he would be able to do and take any of these actions? What could he do, given the complex um, political situation in the US? Yeah, this is an area where I think he has quite a bit of room for maneuver, primarily because Obama has been constrained um, to acting with executive authority because he hasn't been able to get anything through Congress. So there hasn't really been legislation passed related to climate change in the last six years. And the way that the U.S. is going to comply with the Paris Agreements is primarily through regulation, uh, both regulation on um, transportation, especially on cars, uh, but now um, regulation on power plants. Um, and I think in that last area, there is a lot of opportunity for uh, President Trump to uh, scrap the current regulations that have been proposed by the president. They are currently being held by the court system for review, so they haven't been implemented. Um, I think it would be difficult for him to change the uh, auto uh, emission standards, but not impossible. The main constraint there is that the car companies are planning for um, new models several years into the future, and they are taking these proposed regulations as um, the um, goals to which they should aspire. So uh, it will be more difficult to roll those back. But I think even there we could see um, significant changes. So that's the area where I think uh, President Trump would have the most leverage. Mm -hmm. So if Hillary Clinton uh, is elected as president, what do you think she would want to do in the area of climate change and energy? and? To what extent do you think she'd face opposition in Republican-controlled Congress? Right, so she's proposed um, uh, expanding in particular the um, share of electricity that's generated from renewable sources in the U.S. And um, I think she's also very interested in continuing the global um, discourse and encouraging other countries to um, comply with their nationally determined commitments under Paris. Uh, she'll certainly face opposition from the members of Congress who don't believe that climate change is actually occurring, which is um, the dominant view in the Republican Party at the, mo at the moment. Um, so I think it would be difficult for her to find financial resources to invest in research and development um, in the energy area, in uh, climate observation and measurement, um, in model building. So all those areas, I think they would be constrained by fiscal pressures. Um, and uh, there wouldn't be any scope for negotiating formal agreements that the Senate would need to ratify. Um, and the Paris Accords have been adopted on an informal basis and not submitted to the Senate. Um, so that um, is something I think she will stick with. So we're still a few months uh, away from the, the election in November. Um, What's your prognosis as to the likely outcome of the election? Who do you think is going to win? So um, as the famous baseball player Yogi Berra once said, prediction is hard, especially about the future. Um, but uh, I will hazard a guess. I think that Clinton will win. Um, she might win um, a big majority. I think that's possible. Um, but I certainly think she'll, um, she'll win. And. Um, we will see um, a new administration and a continued situation in Washington that's much like we've seen in the last uh, few years. So I'm, I'm predicting uh, more of the same as, as Bill Clinton's uh, campaign uh, famously said. More, he said change versus more of the same. And I think we'll see more of the same.
David, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.